Good evening, everyone. Welcome to TES Presents Talking Startups with Michael Dell. My name is Maria Bolhaus. I'm the president of the Technology Entrepreneurship Society, and we're pleased to bring you this program tonight. In a minute, I'm about to introduce Dr. Bob Metcalf and Mr. Michael Dell. Dr. Metcalf will be interviewing Michael Dell about entrepreneurship and his experiences starting companies. Dr. Metcalf, who in the 1970s, working at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, invented the Ethernet, a technology which he built his company, 3Com, around. 3Com grew and in 2010 was sold, to, uh, was sold for $2.4 billion, at which point Dr. Metcalf joined the venture capital firm uh, Polaris Partners. He now is a professor of innovation here at UT Austin and is one of the three instructors of the one semester startup class. Mr. Dell also attended UT Austin and as a pre-med student, at 19, he formed his first startup company, PCs Limited, right in Adobe Apartment. He then changed the name to Dell's Computer Corporation, grew the company, and by 27, was the youngest CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Today, he is the CEO and chairman of Dell Incorporated, which has 100,000 employees. I'd like to introduce Dr. Bob Metcalf and Mr. Michael Dell. Good evening, y'all. <laughs> I'm new to Texas, so I say y'all a lot. <laughs> uh, we're so happy to have Michael Dell with us here this evening. And the, once again, the topic is startups. And we're going to sort of talk about two aspects. One, Dell as a startup. And we're hoping you'll tell us lots of stories about how you started. And then the second half, after the commercial break, we'll be uh, talking about how startups play in the innovation system of Dell today. Great. Sounds fun. Ready for that? Yeah. Let's start with your parents. Tell us about your parents. Well, my parents are, are both retired now, uh, but uh, my father was an orthodontist, and my mother was a stockbroker, or you could, a fancy name for that would be a financial consultant. Um, and, um, you know, there was a lot of conversation in our house about the economy and the energy crisis and inflation and uh, you know, stock market and uh, a lot of Scientific American magazines floating around and, and uh, it, was, it was a great, great opportunity to grow up in the house I did and I was very fortunate. Is that how you entered here at pre-med, uh, thanks to your dad? Or? Yeah, I was kind of the first one in my family not to be a doctor. Uh, and I was supposed to be a doctor, and, and um, my older brother's a doctor, and uh, all my cousins are doctors, and so a lot of doctors in our family. And so I uh, set down that, that path, but I really loved computers. <laughs> and uh, um, you know, when I got sort of away from, um, from uh, the parental supervision, uh, I sort of got to do whatever I wanted, which was, really was uh, spend more time on, you know, on, 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 on computers and learn, learn more about computers. And uh, you know, that's, that's when I found this incredible opportunity that was the founding of, of what is so today like, Dell. So like the rest of us, when you arrived at your freshman year at college, you were then free to do whatever you wanted to. And so what you chose to do in See, Doby Hall, I have it written down here. Doby Dorm. 2713 is the number. That's right, yeah. Does at the very top. That? Does anyone have that room number now? Or, <laughs> or is it coated in gold or something? <laughs> no, it still looks like a prison. <laughs> <laughs> I went back and looked at it. And, you know, what's interesting about that room is if I look out the window at that room, I can actually see my house. <laughs> ah, and vice versa. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so so you were excited yeah. about computers, not about companies. In other words, you didn't arrive here intending to be a company? You know, um, I grew up in Houston. And if, if you remember the 1970s, Houston was a boom town. And there were all these companies growing and buildings going up. And... You know, I always kind of had this idea that you know one day I'd I'd run a company and and uh, have a big building, a flagpole, and you know, 
out in front. Didn't know what the company would do, but I, I kind of wanted to run a company. You had that picture before you got here. I had that picture kind of when I was a, a little kid. I didn't know what the company was, but uh, and didn't exactly know how it would get there. But you know, it, it was just kind of like a dream. Was there entrepreneurship in your family, or did, where did that idea come from? Something on TV, a TV show? Uh... Well, nobody told me I couldn't do it. Uh, and, and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I certainly didn't go out asking people if, if, if they thought I could. So did you have uh, idols uh, that might have led you to this vision that you wanted to have? I like the flagpole out front. I've been up to uh, Round <laughs> yeah, Rock. There's we, a flagpole well, out front. Actually, we have a lot of flagpoles. We have, <laughs> we have, we have three flagpoles in the front of our, our main building. Of course, we have the Doe flag, and we have the Texas flag, and we have the American flag. Okay, But then we have another building where we serve the United States government and we have the flags of all of the services that we serve for the government. And so, yeah, we, we like that. So you got the flags. We got yeah. the flags, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, was, uh, Dell, so Dell was your first company? It certainly as, a, as, a, as an entity, as a corporation, yeah, for sure. Well, did you sell stuff before? Uh, I did, yeah. yeah, I sold a lot of stuff. Like what? What did you sell? Before? This is before Dell. This is the piece uh, yeah, of upgrade. Well, yeah, uh, you know, when I was about uh, eight, you know, baseball cards. Uh, when I was uh, uh, about 12, 13, um, I ran a, a stamp auction. Ah. Um, when I was uh, 14, I worked in a uh, gold coin and jewelry store. Uh, my first job outside of the house, 12 years old, I, was, I worked at a Chinese restaurant. And I was a water, uh, actually I started as dishwasher, got promoted to water boy, uh, assistant maitre d', then I was recruited away by a different <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> so so uh, how did computers get into this? You had, I, so, I, so uh, um, you know, when I was about seven years old, National Semiconductor came out with that first digital calculator, you know, that when you divided 22 by 7, you know, it was 3, right? No, it wasn't quite accurate, but, but, uh, <laughs> but it was a digital calculator. It actually used semiconductors. And, you know, before that, I remember my dad had this, this adding machine, this Victor adding machine. And I was just fascinated. You could, you know, kind of punch in numbers and make this magical sound and, you know, all these numbers would come out, and I would just play with this thing, and that was really fascinating. So I got this digital calculator, and I was kind of amazed that you could sort of do your math homework with it, right? I so <laughs> thought that was pretty cool. Um, then in uh, junior high school, I guess they call it uh, middle school now, uh, I was in this thing called Number Sense Club, where we do math programs in our head and compete with other kids. and. Um, we thought we were pretty good, but whenever we got to like the city level, the Chinese kids always kill us. <laughs> but anyway, um, the the uh, <laughs> true. That's what, that's what happened? So so uh, so anyway, my teacher got the, a teletype terminal, the first teletype terminal uh, in our junior high school, and we you know, got to write programs on this teletype terminal, send the programs off, and the answer would come back. So this is about seventh grade. And so I got interested in, in you know, computer programming and I was reading Byte Magazine and this is the, you know, uh, you know mid to late 70s. Uh, um, there, there w turns out there was a radio shack in between uh, where we lived and, and, and my school. So I was riding my bike back and forth and after school I'd go to the radio shack and play with the machine. Anyway, saved up bought an Apple II computer, and uh, took, took the Apple II apart, and sort of was really interested in, in you know, how it worked, and what all the different chips did, and, and uh, played around with all sorts of things. I, I um, uh, you know, started upgrading the machine, and... and so uh, you were able to put it back together again after you took it apart? Yeah. That was always my weakness. <laughs> 
I didn't put everything back together, but that 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 I did, uh, um, and um, you know had a, had a number of of uh, different businesses, upgrading computers. Um, I got a, a job when I was uh, 16 at the at at one of the newspapers in Houston, and my job was to sell newspaper subscriptions, and. Uh, what I figured out, what, and the, the way you do this is you'd, you'd work on the telephone, and they would tell you, they'd give you like a list of phone numbers to call. And I figured out the people that were buying the newspaper were either getting married or moving into a new residence. And it turns out that if you go in Texas, when you go to get married, you have to apply for a marriage license, and it's public information. So if you go to the county courthouse, you can say, I would like to have all of the applications for marriage in Travis County, for example. And they're required to give them to you. So I hired a bunch of my buddies in high school and uh, had them go to the 16 surrounding counties around uh, Houston and did this massive direct mail campaign um, and um, you know that was very successful. And you did it without email. This was actual direct mail, I imagine. Yeah, actually, I, I, I had a bunch of these these Apple IIs, and I had them go there and you know type in all this into a little database and you know printed it all out, and, and it, it it was it was a it was a fun thing. All right, so Dell wasn't your first uh, company. It wasn't a corporation, right? But it was a jo that, that was a job. I was actually working for the newspaper. So when you showed up as a freshman, you started upgrading computers in Adobe, and at some moment you decided to make it a company? Yeah, well, what, what happened actually is uh, uh, business was kind of booming, and, um, and I was, I was uh, doing quite well. And my parents sort of heard about all this, and they got pretty upset. That we here we send we send this kid off to college and he's supposed to be studying and in you know they they did a couple of surprise visits they'd show up and they say where are your books I'd say at the library <laughs> good place to keep books I thought you know uh, you know but the, the the dorm room sort of looked like a computer lab you know soldering irons and you know and all sorts of stuff all over the place so they got really upset with me around the uh, Thanksgiving break around 1983. And they sort of made me promise to focus on my studies and not do this whole computer thing while I was supposed to be going to school. And, um, you know, I, um, I, I actually uh, tried to do that. And it worked for about eight or nine days. <laughs> <laughs> this was the Thanksgiving of your freshman year. Fre of my freshman year, right, right. So I, I wasn't very successful as a student, you know, as, as far as that goes. So, 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 then, so then I concluded, okay, this actually isn't like a hobby that I want to do while I'm going to school. This is what I really want to do. So the fact that my parents kind of made me stop doing it probably threw me into it even deeper. So... You know, sort of classic rebellious teenager, uh, adverse reaction uh, kind of thing, and so I also knew that my parents really wouldn't approve, so I just did it anyway. You know. Um. <laughs> so how many how many people did you have before you were forced to move out of Adobe and take real real estate? You mean like like people working for me? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I had had uh, you know friends that would would, would you know. You'd, you'd say, "Hey, you know, can you go deliver these machines, and I'll I'll pay you this." Or, but they weren't. It didn't have actually employees. Um, and and so um, when um, I actually lived in an apartment with a roommate before Adobe, and my roommate got really upset with me because I had all these computers around. He one time he stacked all the computers in front of my door, and I couldn't get out. You know, and <laughs> and so I said, oh, "I gotta leave." You know, so so I. So then I went to Adobe, and, and then UPS man really hated me because I was on the very top floor, and every day all these damn boxes, you know. And he was like, he was like cursing me out. 
So where'd you go next? You moved so, from there somewhere. Yeah, I moved over on uh, uh, 32nd and Duval. Got an apartment with really high ceilings. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you could, it was like a warehouse. You could, like, stack them up, you know, really high. Two bedrooms. It's great. And, um, um, and so that was, that was basically, you know, my, my, my office. Was that January of 84? Uh, it was uh, probably, probably, you know, March, something like that, February, March of 84, some, something like that. Um, so then um, one, of my, um, one of my customers was a lawyer in, in town. And I had sold him a couple of computers and upgraded his computers. And he called me one day and he said, you know, Michael, it seems like um, you've got a thriving little business there. You should probably incorporate your, your company. And I was like, well, why do I need to do that? <laughs> and, uh, and he said, well, there's certain benefits to incorporating and this and this and this. And I said, well, that sounds pretty reasonable. So what are you proposing here? And he says, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you upgrade my computer with a hard drive and I'll do your incorporation and we'll like make a trade. And I said, so let me get this straight. You're going to do the incorporation and I'm going to give you a hard drive and that's a trade and, and, and we're, we're done. He goes, yep, that's right. So I go, okay, sounds reasonable. So um, I go off to, you know, I, I install his hard drive and he comes back and he says, well, there's two problems. First problem is we went to incorporate this name PCs Limited, which was the, the doing business as name that, that, I, that I registered with at the state you know, for sales tax and all that. And it, the name was too generic. So he registered the company as Dell Computer Corporation doing business as PCs Limited. So I said, OK, fine, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, then, and then the second thing is he said, Oh, and I need $1,000 because you can't actually form a corporation in Texas unless you have $1,000. I said, well, wait a second, you didn't tell me about the $1,000. You know, I don't have $1,000. You know, so he goes, well, you've got to have $1,000. So I go, okay, well, I'll go sell some more stuff and come back a few days later. Okay, here's $1,000. Now let's, let's have, we'll have a corporation. And, um, and that was about, that was a, a, a basically about a week or so before my final exams of my freshman year. In like May. May, right. You were yeah. still in school. Yeah, yeah, supposedly, yeah. <laughs> sort of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was still in school, right, yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and, um, and, and actually, um, at, at that point, I decided, okay, uh, I, need to, I need to move this thing out of my, my apartment, right? <laughs> I have to get an office, and I need to get somebody, you know, you know, get at least another person to help me full time. I need to have somebody who can do, like, advertising and start running ads and, uh, you know, really, really grow this thing. So... That's what I that's, you know, kind of set out to do that. Are you familiar with the venture capital term adult supervision? <laughs> I've, I've heard that term before, yeah. yeah. Now, at some point you got some? A couple years later. Um, you know, uh, I, I, ran, I kind of ran into this guy named Lee Walker, who who's, um, I understand, you know, habitates this, uh, this area from time to time. And, um, you know, uh, a couple of people had had said, "Oh, you should you should meet Lee Walker," and 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 apparently, couple, you know, Lee Lee had been told the same thing. You know, <laughs> and so I said, "Okay, well, I'll go meet this guy, Lee Walker," and and that that, that was like '86. So the company was already, um, you know, uh, seventy, eighty million dollars in revenue. So, <laughs> you know. Uh, we we did. Uh, Excuse me. Lee Walker joined when you had seventy million dollars in revenue. Yeah, it was it was eighty six. So we we did uh, we did a, uh, uh, maybe sixty seventy million dollars in revenue. Wow. Uh, so the first nine months we had um, like six million dollars in revenue. When we had thirty three million the first full year, and then like. 66 million. We, we grew 80% a year compounded for the first eight years. 
and we grew 60% compounded for the six years after that. And if you take any number and you compound it at that rate, you get to tens of billions of dollars by the end of that period, which we did. Well, that was a hell of a lot of fun. Well, I hate to, <laughs> hate to I highly recommend it if you ever get a chance to do that. <laughs> So I hate to jump ahead, but uh, yesterday, a day before yesterday, you announced your quarterly results, and you had fifteen point three seven billion dollars in revenue for the quarter, yeah, and nine hundred and thirty-two million in profit for the quarter. So that compounding has really had quite an effect. Yeah, it, yeah. If you if you start with the, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, compounding works. <laughs> so Michael, I'd like to uh, in a minute move on to uh, talking about startups in uh, Dell's innovation system, but before that. We have a commercial break, so I, uh, let's break and come back to talk about startups in Dell's innovation system. Welcome back. We're here with Michael Dell, and we're about to we're about to talk about uh, the role of startups in Dell's innovation system. And I hope there is one. Uh, last night I was at a party that your company held uh, uh, celebrating a new uh, entrepreneur in residence that you have, um, Ingrid Vandervelt, who I, I'm guessing is, there she is, right and there. She is right there. I chided her last night, by the way, she was claiming to be the first entrepreneur in residence at Dell, and I said that, I was, that tonight I was going to interview <laughs> the other entrepreneur in residence at Dell. Uh, so, the, uh, so can we, uh, let's start, uh, do you, for example, do you have, uh, do you ever use the word intrapreneurship? That is, do you stimulate entrepreneurship within Dell? You know, I don't know that we, we get hung up on the particular words, but we do startups inside Dell. And you know, we have a number of examples where we have had, you know, taken a, a new idea and, and taken a group of, of very small teams, like two people, three people, off to the side and said, okay, just go do this. And if anybody gets in your way, just shoot them. Uh, and, and uh, you know. It's Texas. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and uh, you, you're, you're learning quick here. You're, you're, so, um, and some of those have, have grown to be, you know, multi-billion dollar businesses for us. And, you know, certainly as we've, as we've expanded, a lot of that expansion has been organic. We also, in the last several years, have been using acquisitions to accelerate forward movement into new areas. And so in the last uh, 12 months, I think we've acquired nine companies. And you know, that injects not only new talent and new capability, but sort of a fresh perspective and, you know, a new set of entrepreneurs into the company in a, in a new area where we really want to grow and expand. Well, half the people I've met in, in Austin used to work at Dell. Well, you know, we have 110,000 people at Dell. In the last year, we've added 11,000 people to Dell. Not all in Austin, by the way. So you know, we, we are a global company. We operate in 180 countries. But we've, we've added 11,000 people in the last 12 months. So you know, there's, there's a lot of, of growth you know, in, in our business around the world. And, and our earnings, like you mentioned, the last 12 months, earnings per share are up 86%. So one of the things you do is uh, you have a thing called Dwen. The, the Dell Women Entrepreneurs Network. Could you talk a little bit about what that's about? Yeah, we, we have this real belief that uh, entrepreneurs and startups are fundamental to the economy. So if, if you look at uh, the American economy, all of the growth in jobs comes from small firms that double their size in a four-year period or, or less. And so, you know, promoting entrepreneurship, whether it's women, startups, uh, helping new businesses, small businesses, we, we, we believe is incredibly important. And, and uh, certainly, uh, women-owned businesses are a fast-growing segment. You know, we serve all these customers, and so it's a, it's a, it's a great market for us. We, 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 wanna, we wanna promote that, we wanna help accelerate it. I think also in, in, a, you know, in today's job market, it's important to remind everyone where jobs come from. You know, and and it's, it's new companies that start jobs. 
And here we are at the University of Texas. Um, interesting point, you know, find me a place where there are a lot of really successful companies and there's no big university, no big great university nearby. It doesn't exist. You know, all, all, all companies are sort of the offspring of the great universities that exist in the world. And uh, so we, 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 we really believe in, in startups and entrepreneurship and we're making a lot of investments. Uh, earlier was mentioned the, the social uh, entrepreneurship competition that we sponsor here yeah, at the University of Texas. Uh, Dell just donated $5 million to that. Actually, the more, the more interesting part is you've donated the time of 400 employees around the world as mentors, which seems like even a bigger contribution to that effort. How long ago did you do that? Start we, we got involved in that in 2008, and I think the additional commitment was made earlier this year. And this is the Dell Social Innovation Challenge. What does the word social mean in that context? Well, the, the, the contest is really around entrepreneurs solving large social problems that exists, large societal type problems. So the, these aren't necessarily uh, commercial businesses, uh, although some of them may turn into commercial businesses, uh, but um, it, it, they're, they're, they're uh, uh, efforts that, that really address some of the big kind of societal challenges that are out there. Yeah, and and I, I, I'm, I'm a deep believer in technology, right? So if you look at all the challenges in the world, whether it's in healthcare, education, environment, energy, resources, uh, you look at any of the big unsolved scientific problems, I just have a fundamental belief that technology is going to be the, the fulcrum to answering those unsolved questions and driving progress forward. Now that creates challenges, certainly, because you have uh, you know, displacement and, and uh, you know, things are done more efficiently, more productively, skills get replaced, and so it's messy. But, you know, that's, that's, that's what progress looks like. So on that note, we will uh, take a commercial break and return and uh, try to get some questions uh, from the students assembled here. So uh, please come back in a moment. Welcome back, and uh, we're with Michael Dell talking about startups. We've heard some stories about the founding of Dell as a startup, and we've heard some update on Dell Corporation as a, uh, and how it plays with startups in its innovation game. So now we hope to get some questions from the students. That, can we start over here? Are you all ready? Thank you uh, for being here. My name is Omar. Um, I hear a, a lot of entrepreneurs say that uh, you can have the best idea, you can have a really good execution, um, and you can have the best team. But if you roll a zero for luck, you've got nothing. Uh, but I'm still not sure what luck is. Is it uh, meeting the right co-founder? Is it having the right business idea? Um, is it different for different companies? What is luck, Mr. Dell, and how do I get lucky? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I guess I, I'm, uh, I'm not, you know, I mean, I'm sure there is a thing, you know, uh, that, that people would refer to as luck. I wouldn't count on luck as a strategy. It's kind of like having hope as a strategy. I don't think that's a good strategy either. You know, uh, it, it may, may happen. But you know, I, I think uh, um, you know, I think businesses that are really successful, I think people that are really successful, aren't lucky an enormous number of times in a row. So I guess I wouldn't really uh, be a big believer in luck as a as a as a way to be successful. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. 
Thanks again so much for coming and talk to, talking to us, Mr. Dell. Um, if there's one piece of business advice that you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20 and just starting your own company, what would that be? I think, uh, you know, um, what, what I would say is, uh, you know, you don't want to try to have a perfect plan. You have to experiment. You have to make mistakes. You learn when you're failing, not when you're succeeding. And you want to make a lot of mistakes very quickly and, and correct them. Um, and, uh, you, know, you know, you want to iterate. And, you know, if, if you look at... Uh, our business, and you know, if I look at the rate of change in our industry, it's so fast. You, know, you look at these large companies and you say, well, what were they planning five years ago, 10 years ago? You know, when a company gets larger, obviously you have more of a deterministic strategy and you have some existing things that are going. But when you dial the clock back to an earlier stage, you, know, you need to be incredibly fast, incredibly nimble, and agile and not be afraid to go experiment and learn a lot and, and you know, make a lot of mistakes. So when I, first, when I first got to Texas, I went to a basketball game. And uh, this guy walks across the floor and to welcome me to Texas. But I had just become a professor, so I thought I'd ask him the following question, which you haven't asked yet, which is, when you were at UT, did you take any courses in entrepreneurship? Did you enter a business plan competition? Did you go into an incubator uh, for uh, startup companies? Did you do any of those things? No. <laughs> I, took, I took one class in the business uh, school. It was macroeconomics. <laughs> ah. I was a biology major. But had, just following up on that question, had you to do it over again, would you have? Oh, yeah. I, I, I would have totally. Uh, I would have taken at least one accounting class, although I probably would have been really bored. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Next question. Dell, uh, my name is Mark Gibelli, and I'm a freshman in the College of Arts, and I want to thank you again for sharing your experience with us. Um, in his commencement address at Stanford University, Steve Jobs um, pretty much summed up his life's experience and his motto towards, you know, corporate America as stay hungry and stay foolish. Uh, what is your version of that through your experiences and why? Well, um, yeah, that's a good question. You know, I'm, I'm not sure I uh, had as much time to prepare for the question as, as, as <laughs> he did for his commencement address. But, um, you know, I, I, I guess, I guess uh, you know, I'd sort of go back to some of the things I said earlier. Um, you know, you have to be willing to experiment and, and fail and learn and, uh, you know, uh, that, that sort of speed of, of, uh, of, of learning is, is really key. And when, when you find something that's not work, working, go fix it, you know, really fast. Um, I, do, I do think that, that you also want to, uh, you know, do something you, you love doing, right? And, and uh, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, it's 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 hard to be really great at something if you're not super passionate about it. And and um, you know, uh, I also think that there's a measure of balance here, right? I've been doing this for 27 and a half years. You want to do something for a long time, a relatively long time. You have to figure out what the balance is for you in terms of working hard, playing hard, and, you know, there's a, uh, I certainly figured out uh, a while ago that while it's really fun to work, that's not the only thing there is in life, and uh, there, are, there are other, other things, and, and you got you to gotta keep those in the right balance uh, if you're going to be successful and be able to do it for a long time. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on what's happening in the country, uh, in a lot of these cities where small businesses are really like not doing well, having a lot of difficulty making ends meet, having a lot of difficulty getting credit uh, to make those ends meet, uh, and what that means and maybe what we can do about it, what's going to happen? <laughs> sure. Well, if, if, you, if you look at, you know, the last 
century or so, you know, the Western economies have done pretty fabulously well compared to Eastern economies, you know, uh, China, India. But as of the last decade or so, there's been an incredible catch-up. And China, India, you know, at one point were ahead of the United States and, and, and Europe in terms of their economic development, fell way, way behind. The West zoomed ahead for all kinds of reasons. And now what you've seen is this kind of three billion people coming into the global workforce that are very talented, very hardworking. And for a developed nation like the United States to maintain its relative standard of living in the world is an incredibly hard challenge. Now, the only way to have a hope of meeting that challenge is to have an enormous amount of innovation and skills and technology and talent. And even with all of that, the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the challenge is just a huge one, given this onslaught of, of uh, uh, you know, new labor supply that's, that's you know, uh, occurring all over the world. Now, the whole, whole pie is getting bigger, but... You know, America has about three and a half percent of the world's population and over half of the wealth of the world. Uh, you know, in 20 years, in 50 years, it's probably not going to be like that. So the overall pie is going to get bigger. And, you know, th there, are certainly, there are certainly challenges here. And, and, you know, the most challenged are the... Uh, you know, the, the uh, less than super skilled workers in the developed countries. Uh, now, I think, I think you, know, you know, here in the United States, we got ourselves in this real challenge where we were spending more money than we had as a government and as consumers. And there's really no way you can spend more money than you have over any length of time, have something good happen. So we have to stop doing that. And, you know, our political system, you know, looks for short-term solutions to long-term problems that really aren't there. They're longer-term problems, and they have to be solved with longer-term solutions. And, uh, you know, I'm not... I'm not even sure the political system has uh, comprehended the, the competitive dynamics in, 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 that are going on in the world. I mean, if you go to Washington, D.C., you rarely hear the words competitiveness. And even worse, if you do hear it, almost never does it apply to world competitiveness, which is really the way the world works now. You know how how does how does one group of people succeed, you know, in, in, in the world relative to another? Fact is that that uh, uh, you know the U.S. has already won on a relative basis. So maybe not the answer you're looking for, but but uh, it, it's sort of the reality of the situation. Well, I guess a quick follow-up question: What can Austin do, uh, or what can Austin maybe be an example of for other American cities right now? I think I think you need uh, an environment that encourages risk-taking. I think you need more startups. I think you need uh, risk capital, risk appetite. Um, you know, you need uh, great universities and and um, focus on big. Areas of innovation that are that are going to really be valuable uh, breakthrough areas, um, you know. But they're 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 definitely tricky tricky challenges. Hello, um, my name is Bryant, and I'm on a one semester startup team. And um, it seems to me that all the uh, popular CEOs and founders of companies like a uh, uh, Bill Gates, Michael Dell, you, Michael Dell, and Mark Zuckerberg, and everyone it seems to be like a dropout. And then what's compared to like you probably start a company and your parents didn't like it, and maybe some of the people didn't like your idea about starting a company and drop out from the university. So what should be like primary motivation? What was the primary motivation for you to drop out and then decide to become and start a company? 
you know, my motivation wasn't to drop out. My mo motivation was that I saw this incredible opportunity and it, it, I just had to do it. So, uh, it, you know, I, 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 I was irresistible, you know. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the, certainly when I was 19 years old, the risk reward was overwhelmingly in favor of taking, you know, the, the risk, right? Uh, a thousand dollar investment, and if it didn't work, go right back to school, and away you go. So there's uh, uh, Jobs and Gates and Dell and Zuckerberg and Mackey. That's only five dropouts. Charles Manson also dropped out of college, so you know. I mean, <laughs> You know, we, we often not, overlook not, don't get carried away here. You know, but, uh, I wanted to. Some companies were founded by people who finished college. I mean, like for example, my company. Uh, I suspect most. Yeah. I, I suspect a lot of companies were founded by people who graduated from college. Yeah. So we should make a list of those as a homework assignment. So my name is Manan, and I want to go back to your early years at Dell. Uh, what was the point at which you started putting together the pieces to build really a multi-billion dollar company? That, uh, and you did that consciously. Well, as, as I mentioned, the company grew quite fast. And it actually started not making PCs, but making upgrade kits for computers. When the original IBM personal computer came out in 1981, it had no hard disk drive, and it had very little DRAM memory. And so the business I started with was making hard disk drive upgrade kits for the IBM personal computers and memory upgrade kits for those, for those computers. And then, uh, you know, a little bit later, we started designing and making our own IBM compatible computers. But the company grew very, very fast. And you know, certainly there were distinct phases of, of expansion in terms of how do you expand globally? How do you expand into new types of customers? How do you build additional product lines? How do you grow, grow services? How do you build a larger sales force? Um, so, you know, you know there, there were probably every year or so a fairly distinct wave of new things that we were doing to drive the next wave of growth. And, you know, many times that involved new injections of, of talent and capability, you know, that were needed to go make that happen. But we, we figured it out as we, as we went along, making so, mistakes all, all the way along. So those first... Uh, disk upgrades. How, how many gigabytes were those disks? <laughs> oh yeah, lots of gigabytes. Yeah, they were five megabyte disk drives. Well, what would you use all that space for? <laughs> well, this this is uh, in 1986. We went to the uh, Comdex trade show in Atlanta, and we had the world's first 12 megahertz 286 computer. <clears throat> At the time, IBM had a six megahertz computer, and Compaq had an eight megahertz computer. So ours was twice as fast as IBM's. And our booth was swamped with people. And half the people wanted to know how they could get one. They were all the Autodesk and, D and, and DBase users. And the other half were people wondering, why in the world would anybody need a computer that fast? <laughs> Uh, my question is, what keeps you motivated, and also what what allows you to continue seeing the ultimate picture for Dell itself, e whether it's advice or anything at like that? Well, I think you know motivation is is a very personal thing. I mean, for me, I get incredibly excited when I see how technology is enabling human potential around the world, and I think about what's happening in medicine or energy or, you know, I'll, I'll give you a great example. You know, there's a lot of data that's being stored in the world. 
and there, the, the amount of data that's being stored is increasing at a tremendous rate. And anytime you're doing anything, you know, whether it's involved in healthcare or you're buying something or selling something, there's an opportunity to collect data. Most organizations actually don't really have any way of using that data to make tremendously better decisions, but they're going to in, in the future. And that's a whole field that is going to open up all sorts of new productivity and, and uh, opportunity, and particularly when you start applying that to small and medium-sized businesses. And so, um, you know, I, I, I just get tremendously uh, excited about those kinds of opportunities. And, uh, you know, when I see the, the, the progress in the world and how technology is right at the the, the center of that, that's what get, gets me motivated. But as I said, you know, motivation is a very personal thing. You know, you got to kind of find what it is for, for you. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Dell. My name's Akshay. Um, my question to you is, although most people would like to start startups, risks are a big, op big obstacle uh, to most people. Uh, when you were starting out, I bet $1,000 was a lot of money. Uh, what made you keep going, even though sometimes you might think like uh, you might lose that money and the business might fail? What made you keep going? I was having a great time. You know, it was, it was thrilling, uh, terrifying, uh, you know, um, fun, exciting, uh, you know, opportunity. Uh, you know, I mean, at various times, I, I kind of thought, well, it would be a really bad end to the story if I stopped now, right? So, so you know, you know, kind of kept going. Um, you know, I think, I think the, the, your question is interesting because if I look at the data in the last three or so years, there's been a precipitous decline in the number of new companies that are being started in the United States. And so the willingness and the appetite to take on this, this, this personal risk, individual risk, has gone down. That's very concerning because if you look in the world, the U.S. for a long time was quite distinguished because Japan had capital, Germany had capital, and they, you know, a lot of smart people in the world, but the U.S. was distinguished in the appetite for risk and the acceptance that if you started a company and it didn't go so well, you learned something, go, go do another one, right? And that's okay. But in Germany and Japan, nah, not really. You know, if you, if you failed, you're a failure and you're done, right? So uh, it, what's interesting now is, of course, in China and India, you see some unbelievably aggressive risk-taking entrepreneurs and risk capital flowing very, very freely. And that, to me, is, is quite troubling for U.S. competitiveness, along with this decline in, in the number of, of startups that, that, are, uh, that, that are occurring. So I don't, I don't know exactly why that's happening, but uh, we, we, we need more uh, of, of those startups for our, our economy to grow. Remember, all of the job growth comes from small companies doubling in size every four years. And if you don't have those companies, no job growth. <laughs> and so, you know, big, big uh, problem if, if, if we don't have those. Thank you very much. Mr. Dell, as you can tell, I'm not a student, uh, but I appreciate you being here and had a question. Either that or you've been working at it a long time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I am uh, the founder of a cloud integration services company and just had a question regarding how you looked at startups. Considering PCs were generally invented right around 1980, you were starting your company in 83, 84. How could you tell there was going to be such a tremendous demand for PCs out into the future and causing yourself to go ahead and take that risk and start that company? I wouldn't say it was a perfect vision for everything that was going to happen, but you know what I did sense was that this idea of the personal computer was really powerful. You know, the fact that for, at the time, $2,000 an individual or a small business could buy a, 
a calculating machine with all this power, a personal computer, whereas before, you know, you had to buy a mini computer or a mainframe, and only the midsize or the big companies could do that. That to me was incredibly exciting. I saw, you know, uh, when I was in junior high school, how you could program and write these programs, and that was incredibly powerful. I, I created a bulletin board system, which these were sort of the precursors to what you think of today as social media. Saw saw that, and you know, it just felt like an, an incredible opportunity to me, but. You know, I didn't know there would be a billion and a half PCs in the world today, uh, but you know, sure seemed like there'd be more than, than there were when I started. Mr. Dell, um, you started Dell in a time that, I mean, other people are selling PCs to. Uh, you see right now people are, there's cloud computing, everybody wants to do cloud, and there's a lot of social networking, social stuff, so there's a lot of competition. So when you're, when you're in this area and you're starting a company, uh, how do you deal with this competition? What was what was Dell's uh, competitive advantage, and, and were you always were you thinking about is anybody copy going to copy the way I'm doing things, and and how do I protect myself from that? You know, in, in 1984, when I started Dell, the prevailing wisdom was that there would really be no American computer companies. All of the computer companies were going to be Japanese. And the Japanese were going to take over the world. There was incredible fear of the Japanese. And you had uh, Semitech and MCC started here in Austin, largely as technology consortias to deal with this Japanese threat. And everybody was, was afraid of all that. There were plenty of competition. You know, I think uh, you know, we distinguished ourselves with a unique business model, customer relationships. Uh, and I think largely we were doing things that were misunderstood by our competitors. And, uh, you know, when you're doing something uh, new and different, um, you know, that, 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 that happens a, a fair bit. And, and so I, I, don't think, I don't think IBM or Compaq really understood what we were doing or why it was working. And by the time they did, you know, it was already... Uh, you know, very, very, very large. How I'm, big were you when that when they realized that that it was already you were already far away? What year was that? Maybe because if I'm wrong, you you I mean your business model was to sell point to point instead of having these big retailers. That was what IBM and, and everybody else was doing. So people were saying, why would I want to sell sell send this per, send this PC directly to the other to, directly to one other person? I'm just gonna have a retail. So you did that, and that was. Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's how it started, mostly to businesses, although people think we started mostly to consumers. Our, our business has always been mostly to businesses and business to business. Um, you know, we were already several billion dollars, I think, before our competitors figured out what we were doing. I'm sorry, you know, we have a long line, uh, Michael, of people wanting to ask questions, but we've run out of time, so I... Uh I have to apologize. Thank you very much for an honor to have the last question. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I please in, I invite you all to join me in thanking Michael. And uh, we have a special way to thank you, Michael. Let, let's have Mariel come out. We hear you're quite the basketball fan. Oh, wow. So thank you. A personalized basketball from Coach Rick Barnes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.